December 29, 1876, Ashtabula, Ohio. An engineer feels a sharp crack beneath his wheels and opens the throttle trying to clear the span. The locomotive barely makes it across. Behind it, the bridge connection fails. Eleven cars carrying about 160 people plunge roughly 70 feet into the frozen river below. Oil lamps ignite the wooden wreckage almost immediately. Fire crews arrive, but extreme cold, ice, and the intensity of the fire severely limit what they can do. By the time the scene is under control, 92 passengers have lost their lives trapped in ice and debris. The bridge was 11 years old. Meanwhile, there is a granite bridge in Maryland, built in 1835, called Thomas Viaduct. It was nicknamed Latrobe's Folly in some early accounts, and it remains in rail service today often cited as still carrying modern freight and passenger trains, nearly 190 years later. So why do century-old bridges still carry modern freight trains while some newer structures collapse? Part of the answer lies in the forces engineers anticipated when these bridges were designed. Early 1900s steam locomotives weren't just heavy, they were mechanically violent, pistons slamming, rods whipping, counterweights spinning, the whole machine shaking rails like a continuous mechanical shock. Each axle load imposed repeated dynamic forces on bridge structures. Engineers knew this, and by the early 20th century, many bridges were designed conservatively, using standardized load models such as Cooper E ratings, building in far more capacity than locomotives typically delivered. Modern diesels weigh similar, often in the low 400,000 pound range for six axle freight units, but use smooth electric traction motors with no hammer blow effect, no reciprocating mass forces, just steady load distribution. That is why Thomas Viaduct still works. It was designed for levels of mechanical stress that are no longer present in modern rail operations. Materials matter too. Masonry arch bridges are widely regarded as exceptionally durable. Roman stone bridges remain in use today after 2,000 years, and engineering surveys and transportation studies have shown that a significant proportion of masonry bridges built before 1910 remain in service today. Steel-reinforced concrete can deteriorate much faster. Research literature, including studies associated with Queen's University Belfast, has discussed how masonry arches can remain serviceable for centuries, while reinforced concrete structures may face durability challenges as embedded steel corrodes and cracks develop in surrounding concrete over time. American railroads learned this expensive lesson. They went from stone to steel and then back to stone because steel bridges kept failing as loads increased. Sometimes those failures resulted in serious accidents, and they made passengers nervous about riding over structures that might collapse. The Carrollton Viaduct proves this. It was built between 1828 and 1829 and is commonly described as one of the earliest major stone masonry railroad bridges in the United States. At the cornerstone ceremony, Charles Carroll, the last living signer of the Declaration of Independence, later reported that he considered the project one of the most important acts of his life, second only to signing the Declaration. Andrew Jackson, the first president to ride a railroad, crossed it in June 1833. It remains in active freight service today under CSX nearly 196 years later. Statistics back this up. Industry surveys indicate that a large proportion of steel railroad bridges across North America are now more than a century old, numbering in many thousands of spans, and studies suggest that conservative original design has allowed many to remain in service far longer than simplified lifespan calculations would predict. Rail engineering specialists have frequently noted that railroad bridge longevity comes from generations of engineers who took a conservative approach, building for the immense weight of steam locomotives. That means today's modern locomotives place less stress than the original design anticipated. But not all bridges make it. June 24, 2023, Yellowstone River, Montana. A Montana rail link bridge collapsed during a derailment. Ten cars derailed into the river, releasing approximately 419,000 pounds of hazardous material with contamination reported far downstream along the river. Federal investigators classified the event as a catastrophic railroad bridge failure.
Bridge inspection records indicate it was inspected roughly one month before the collapse, with ultrasonic testing reported within the preceding months, and no urgent concerns publicly identified prior to the failure. Detailed inspection findings were not publicly released, so exact missed indicators remain unknown. One detail often highlighted in reporting is this. A parallel highway bridge of similar age and location was removed in 2021 by the Montana Department of Transportation after being declared structurally unsafe. The railroad kept their bridge operating until 2023, when it collapsed. January 4, 2025, Corvallis, Oregon. After a fire in 2022 damaged a railroad bridge, wooden trestles burned. Michelle Emmons of Willamette Riverkeeper observed the damage and publicly said the footings appeared heavily burned and potentially structurally compromised. Yet the railroad was still sending rail cars over the bridge, raising concerns about long-term safety. Portland and Western Railroad made repairs and kept operating. Roughly two years later, the bridge collapsed, releasing 150,000 pounds of fertilizer into the river. Railroad spokesperson Tom Siuba said that cosmetic appearance and smell of creosote do not necessarily signify structural damage. That reflected the railroad's position that visible damage alone did not demonstrate structural failure. October 2023, Pueblo, Colorado a freight train derailed near a bridge over Interstate 25, and a semi-truck below was struck. Federal investigators reported a broken rail near the bridge approach, and they examined welding and maintenance practices. Investigators concluded the failure was linked to maintenance-related defects rather than the age of the bridge itself. A pattern appears to emerge. Ash Tabula was bad design, with cast iron that was brittle in cold weather. Yellowstone was inspected and later failed. Corvallis continued operating despite fire damage. Pueblo had a bad weld that no one caught. Failures are not because bridges are old, but because of design choices, inspection gaps, or ignored warnings. The Federal Railroad Administration has reported it has only a small number of dedicated bridge inspectors overseeing roughly 70,000 railroad bridges nationwide, which works out to 11,666 bridges per inspector. Investigative reporting indicates some railroads went years without receiving federal bridge audits. Inspection reports were kept secret, often citing security concerns. Local mayors who requested reports for bridges in their own towns received heavily redacted versions. Congresswoman Summer Lee from Pennsylvania introduced the Rail Bridge Safety and Transparency Act, which would create a national public database with independent inspections and fines for discrepancies. According to Lee, the proposal stalled amid resistance from industry interests. The Office of Inspector General issued a critical review in 2016. The Federal Railroad Administration said bridge-related derailments were caused by other factors and not by bridge failure, but the Inspector General's findings showed structural deficiencies contributed to multiple bridge-related accidents from 2007 to 2014. Following the Tempe, Arizona derailment in July 2020, Union Pacific acknowledged during federal proceedings that the absence of inner guardrails contributed to the severity of the incident. Tomasz Garonski, director of bridge inspections, testified to the National Transportation Safety Board that the total number of bridges identified as requiring inner guardrails was 635, with 218 not yet equipped at the time. He explained it would be a rather costly effort to install inner guardrails. In 2020, Union Pacific reported revenue of $19.5 billion, with a profit of $5.3 billion. In August 2025, NPR asked Union Pacific if those 218 bridges now have guardrails. The company declined to provide an updated figure, and five years later, there was still no confirmation. Old bridges often survive because they were overbuilt to resist the violent forces of steam locomotives. Early engineers followed conservative Cooper E-load standards, built in massive safety margins, and used robust materials such as stone that perform well in compression instead of steel reinforced concrete that can corrode. Modern locomotives use smoother traction motors and generally impose lower dynamic forces. They do not create the hammer blow of steam engines. 
the Thomas Viaduct still stands after 190 years because it was built to withstand far more punishment than modern trains impose. The system depends on railroads inspecting their own bridges, and many inspection reports are kept secret. There are only six federal inspectors responsible for 70,000 bridges. A federal transparency bill is stalled. Five years ago, Union Pacific acknowledged that 218 bridges were missing safety equipment, and Union Pacific has not publicly confirmed completion. After the Ashtabula disaster, Chief Engineer Charles Collins testified before a state legislature committee. Historical records show he was later found deceased under circumstances officially ruled a suicide, though later accounts and rediscovered documents have raised questions about that conclusion. Railroad President Amasa Stone denied design flaws, blamed derailment or weather, and paid $500,000, equivalent to $14.8 million today, to settle claims. The Thomas Viaduct still stands, and the Carrollton Viaduct still carries trains, with granite that is 190 years old still doing its job. The Yellowstone Bridge was inspected shortly before its collapse. The status of 218 Union Pacific bridges is unknown, and many inspection reports remain not public or heavily redacted.